the story of the kings and queens of England is more surprising than you might think. It's a fine drama, a thousand years of tales of lust and betrayal, of heroism and cruelty, of mysteries, murders, tragedies, and triumphs. But there's more than that. For example, one of the most reliable chronicles describes how a king of England proposed adopting Islam as the national religion. This episode, the first of six, includes that tale. It tells the story of the English crown from 1066 to 1216, from one French invader, William, to the next, Louis. Yes, Louis, another surprise. A king of England who's pretty much disappeared from history. It's easier to say where the history of the English monarchy ends than where it begins. It ended on the 14th of October, 1066, here at what became Battle Abbey on Senlac Hill near Hastings. We all know that this was where Harold was killed and replaced by William the Conqueror. And Harold was the last Englishman to be crowned king. From then on, the sovereign would always be from a foreign family, right down to Queen Elizabeth II. So a history of the kings and queens of England isn't like the history of kings and queens anywhere else in the world. What happened here on that October day started a completely new history, which is why it's the one date in history that everybody knows. 1066. The story of that day was spelled out in a strip cartoon, the Bayer Tapestry, probably stitched for William's brother Odo. Here's our hero's first appearance in the story. That's William, Duke of Normandy, about 37 years old in 1064. He's being told that Harold Godwinson, Earl of Wessex at the time, has been shipwrecked on the French coast. One of these guys is Godwinson. I think it's the chap with the handlebar moustache. He's about six years older than William and the most powerful man in England after King Edward. These are both pretty hard men, survivors in a very tough world. William spent his whole life fighting for survival and was good at it. By the time he was 20, he'd established complete control over Normandy. From then on, he was fighting to hang on to what he had. He got Harold to help him in one of those battles, capturing Mont Saint-Michel. And then, apparently as the price of letting him go home, had Harold swear to support him in becoming the next King of England. Which, as the tapestry very clearly shows, is not what happened. Ah! When old King Edward died, Harold, as we all know, had himself crowned instead. Actually, to be a bit more precise, he had himself elected king. The crown of England in those days was not inherited, but awarded. In William's view, this had all gone very badly wrong, so he set about putting it right. The Norwegian ruler, Harald Hardrada, took a similar view. There was an old Norwegian claim to England, which he decided to revive by launching an invasion of his own. Their two fleets arrived within a few days of each other, one in the north of England, one in the south. Both fleets were probably about the same size, about 500 ships. King Harold rushed north and destroyed Hadrada's army. Only about 34 ships made it back to Norway. Then he rushed south. But this time, of course, he failed to pull it off. We don't know for sure that the man with the arrow in his eye is Harold, but he certainly died at the battle. He and his axe-wielding, spear-carrying army of Danish and Anglo-Saxon noblemen were simply swept away. In their place were the new rulers of England, Normans on horseback, and William was their master, master of the country. He owned it. He was not an elected king. When he went to London to be crowned on Christmas Day, the population, thinking that was their duty now, tried to elect him. They acclaimed him with loud shouts. The Normans, not knowing what was going on, thought this was some kind of uprising. They rushed out of Westminster Abbey and burned London down. England had become a new kind of kingdom, 
one which was owned lock, stock and barrel by its king. The story we're telling through this series, the story of a thousand years of English history, is the story of this alien conqueror and his successors to the throne. It's the story of how they changed England and changed with it, eventually turning into puppet rulers, symbols of power they cannot wield, and how in that transformation they survived through tides of revolution and republicanism, so that today, while they're not quite the only surviving royals in Europe, they alone still lay claim to majesty. Now, how did that happen? The story of William's reign is really the story of a warrior lord taking all power into his hands. He confiscated all the privately owned land in the country. Its new occupiers were tenants of the king, bound to him. People of the north of England, with their Viking capital at York, were much more bound to Scandinavia than to Normandy. They refused to submit. He punished them by destroying all animals and all crops between York and Durham. According to the chronicles, he celebrated Christmas 1070 in the ruins of York. The inhabitants were reduced to starvation, even cannibalism. Sixteen years later, when all the land in England was accounted for and valued in his doomsday survey, there were places in Northumbria that were still utterly worthless. The church, too, was made Norman, and old Anglo-Saxon ways crushed. At Glastonbury, archers were stationed inside the abbey, and orders given that the old chants should be replaced by new ones from France. Twenty-one monks were shot, and yet there were limits to his power. A few thousand Normans, most of them not even understanding the language of their new country, couldn't run the place. They needed the English to keep everything working, and William understood that perfectly well. His coronation, he made an oath to uphold the laws of King Edward, to uphold good law and renounce bad. The old courts would continue to function, and old traditions would normally be respected. This oath would become fundamental to the coronation of any king. The question, though, would be who got to wear the crown? When William died, bloated and exhausted at the ripe age of 60, his attendants stripped his body and scattered. What mattered now was who would hold the land he'd conquered and how. It had all been his, and it was he who'd decided. On his deathbed in Normandy, he handed out the spoils. He gave his eldest surviving son, Robert, his duchy of Normandy. But it was the younger son, the red-haired William, William Rufus, who the conqueror willed should be acclaimed King of England. And the youngest, Henry, was told he would have to be content with 5,000 pounds. But Henry was his father's son. Content with 5,000 pounds? Was that likely? The key to the plotting that followed was that, of course, none of the brothers was content. Henry stirred the brew of resentment that made Robert try to take the Kingdom of England from William, and William try to take the Duchy of Normandy from Robert. And Henry was always changing sides, weakening them both. Eventually, Robert, tiring of the whole struggle, decided it would be more satisfying to fight Saracens than his brothers, and went off on crusade. William was now secure and powerful, and Henry changed his policy. He was now William Rufus's very best, best friend. The Bishop of Lincoln later said that when Henry praised anyone, he was sure to be plotting that person's destruction. It does seem as though Henry concentrated on quietly stirring up discontent among churchmen and barons in England, which was not hard, as William Rufus needed their money and had little to offer in return, except to give to some what he'd taken from others. And besides, William Rufus wasn't their kind of chap. He didn't marry, he had no children, and as one chronicle puts it, All things that are loathsome to God and to earnest men were customary in this land in his time. And therefore, he was loathsome to well nigh all his people and abominable to God. Which is, of course, homophobic chronicle speak for being gay. On the 2nd of August, in the year 1100, both William and Henry were hunting separately in the New Forest. It was the last day of William Rufus's life. 
No one knows who fired the arrow that ended the reign of William Rufus. His companion Tyrrell immediately fled and disappeared abroad. William's body was abandoned where it lay, at a spot still marked by this stone. The next day, local peasants took it in a cart to Winchester. Henry had arrived before them. Winchester was where the royal treasure was kept. He demanded the treasury keys from the guards. They refused to hand them over, saying that Robert, his elder brother, was the rightful heir. Henry drew his sword and declared that no one should stand between him and his father's scepter. Resistance collapsed, and when the peasants arrived with their cart, the lords of England were busy electing Henry as their king, the first elected ruler of England since Harold Godwinson. The Bishop of Winchester refused to give the corpse a Christian burial. Out of respect for his royal status, William Rufus was nevertheless interred under the cathedral tower, and when that collapsed a few years later, everyone said, Told you so. Henry's coronation at Westminster was an attempt to ensure his authority to rule. He was 32 years old, his father had won the country by force of arms, and his barons backed him for rich rewards, but why would anyone want a king now? Alongside his sanctification by the church, he issued a charter promising that he would not overtax the church or his tenants in chief, and that they must treat their tenants as he treated them. He claimed that the crown changed his nature. He was no longer an ordinary human being. As the anointed king, he held special, divinely granted powers. His touch was supposed to cure scrofula, swollen neck glands from tuberculosis. This magic power, which became known as touching for the king's evil, was practiced by English monarchs for the next 700 years as proof of their divine authority. He also quite smartly understood that it was a good idea to promote new people to positions of power. Those who were already great barons didn't need a king, but men on the make would support him. By the time Robert was able to mount a challenge to Henry, it stood no chance. He agreed to recognize Henry as King of England in exchange for a pension. Of course, it didn't last. Henry ended up invading Normandy in 1106 and imprisoning his brother for the rest of his life. This is his tomb in Gloucester Cathedral. The question of who was entitled to succeed to the crown was still, when you came down to it, a matter of brute force. But Henry's victory had a profound symbolic meaning because it changed the status of the English crown. Under his father, England had been a property seized and owned by the Duke of Normandy. Now, Normandy was a property seized and owned by the King of England. Henry was a naturally cheery person. Just after his coronation, he married Edith, the daughter of an English woman and of the King of Scotland, and he encouraged Normans he was promoting to marry English women. The great barons regarded this with contempt and referred to their king and queen as Godric and Godiva, a style statement which roughly translates as Sid and Gladys. As sturdy warriors, they also didn't appreciate the fact that he was literate in three languages. His other nickname, Henri Beauclerc, means Henry the Swat. But those great barons were having their power undercut as Henry recruited his government officers and judges from the church. He supervised his kingdom by moving his court from one center to another. It was a great traveling performance, like a circus with no permanent home. He spent half his time in Normandy, but when he was away, the kingdom was run by a totally reliable civil servant, Roger, the Bishop of Salisbury, who was called the Justiciar. The idea of government by a system rather than by a man was beginning to take shape. He sent judges on their own tours of the country and enforced the laws harshly, which seems to have been quite popular according to the chroniclers. But his punishments were often based on the idea that people were guilty until proved innocent, and there was no time to do that. Were England's lanes really full of blinded and mutilated men muttering, um, but fair? You'd think so from the sources we have. They liked a strong king. And he managed to keep the treasury well stocked with money, which meant he could buy loyalty when he needed to. The key to this was his system for checking his income. Twice a year, sheriffs and royal officials from all over England had to bring their money to be counted by being shunted around in piles on a checkered cloth like a chessboard. Checked. It was called the Exchequer. 
the system worked so well that the cabinet minister in charge of the nation's finances is still called the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and we still use paper chitties called checks. By a combination of force and diplomacy, he controlled and to some extent colonized Wales. Relations with Scotland were fine. Three of his wife's brothers became kings there. England was becoming a peaceful, stable and successful kingdom. Henry sent his young daughter Matilda to Germany to marry the Holy Roman Emperor. And in 1116, he held a great assembly at Salisbury where all the barons, nobles and bishops swore homage to his son William as his successor to the crown. In 1120, young William was a star, an enthusiastic warrior, a keen huntsman, and the heir apparent. He'd been in Normandy with his father fighting the King of France, and the whole party was returning to England. William and his pals were traveling in a brand new ship, the White Ship. They were the 12th century English jet set, the millionaire knightly lads who were heirs to most of England and Normandy. Once they got on the ship, there was a terrific party. Alcohol was taken, and how? Soon it became really rowdy, the Hooray Henrys yelling at one another and throwing off a bunch of priests who'd come to bless the voyage. William's cousin, Stephen of Blois, had an upset stomach and he felt he needed a bit of peace and quiet, so he decided to go ashore and take a later ship. By the time they got to sea, it was already dark and the other ships were way ahead. The wind was light. William decided to catch up with the king and ordered the chaps to start rowing. The master was as drunk as anyone else, so they began to speed into the dark. 50 oars pushing this state-of-the-art longboat at a terrific lick. That was when they sailed straight into a rock and smashed the ship open. The rock of Barfleur was a well-known hazard to navigation. The cries of the drowning company were heard on shore and on the king's ship, but everyone thought the party was still in full swing. In fact, the future of England had just been destroyed in the equivalent of a drunken car crash. It's said that Henry never smiled again. You can see why. Six years after the fatal crash, not knowing what else to do, Henry obliged the barons, nobles and bishops of England to swear fealty to his daughter, Matilda, as his successor, just as he'd had them swear to his son. But there was, of course, a huge difference. No woman had ever ruled in her own right in either England or Normandy. Her husband, the Emperor, was dead, but for strategic reasons he had Matilda marry the son of the Count of Anjou. This was not a family with a power base in England. Henry's sleep was filled with nightmares of peasants and barons complaining that he'd failed them all. And then Henry went and died of a surfeit of lampreys. How does that happen? A lamprey is a parasitic fish that looks as if it belongs in a bush tucker trial. Henry loved them. His doctor had put him on a diet that involved not eating lampreys, and he got a fever and died after ignoring the advice. And the doctor said, as doctors do, I warned him. By the time Henry died in 1135, it was all falling apart. He was 67 years old, and he'd gone a long way towards defining the job of a king of England. But the fundamental problem, who was entitled to that job, had still not been solved. Matilda was in Anjou with her husband. And then up popped Stephen of Blois, who sailed from Normandy to England and claimed the crown. Stephen, who had been saved from drowning on the white ship by an urgent need for a lavatory. He was the son of Henry's sister, a legitimate grandson of William the Conqueror. He'd also been the leading baron to swear fealty to Matilda as the heir apparent. But that was then, and this was now. He was 38 years old, backed by his very tough mother, and one of his brothers was the Bishop of Winchester with the keys to the royal treasury. The wife of the Count of Anjou was not a popular choice with the barons. Stephen was a norm. Besides, he seemed a malleable sort of chap, brave enough and high-spirited. He was also generous, courteous and affable, and would probably do as he was told. Which was, of course, a recipe for disaster and was crowned by the Archbishop of Canterbury at Westminster on Christmas Day, 1135. He issued what was now the traditional coronation oath, promising to respect the old laws and be nice to everyone. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, 
When they saw that the king was a good-natured and kindly man who inflicted no punishment, they committed all kinds of terrible crimes. All had done homage and sworn oaths of fealty, but none were kept. Meanwhile, Matilda was enraged and, of course, had her own supporters. England was moving rapidly to civil war. Stephen was insecure. He surrounded himself with people from near Blois, Flemings, which didn't go down well with the barons. He bought loyalty until it emptied the treasury and then began confiscating property so that he could pay his supporters. By the time Matilda landed to claim her throne in 1141, Stephen was trying to put down rebellion after rebellion. He was a brave, even ferocious fighter, but his support melted away and he was captured in a battle at Lincoln. Stephen was Matilda's prisoner. The church council declared that he was deposed by the manifest judgment of God and recognized Matilda as queen. Matilda proceeded to Westminster and was all set to be crowned. And then something went peculiarly wrong. Something that carries an extraordinarily clear message about the job of being the monarch of England. All Matilda's understanding of monarchy had been learned in Germany, where she'd been empress since she was 12 years old. She had been popular and successful there. After the emperor's death, when Henry I had brought her back to England, some German princes of the empire followed her to demand her back as their sovereign. But the sovereignty she had learned was absolute power. The emperor's will was law. The only possible higher law was the church. That was not how it worked in England. Even the conqueror had promised at his coronation to respect the laws of England. But Matilda flatly refused. She didn't need a coronation to be queen. In her view, she already was. She behaved imperiously, which might mean magnificently in German, but meant intolerably in English. And when the citizens of London petitioned her for a renewal of King Edward's laws, she not only refused to listen, but demanded a heavy tax from them. So they threw her out. Stephen was released from prison and resumed his battered kingship. In fact, he had a second coronation. Matilda roamed around the Midlands and the West Country fighting for a throne that she was entitled to, but could never have. In 1143, just before Christmas, Stephen finally had her trapped and starving in Oxford Castle. But unbelievably, Matilda and three knights got away. It had snowed, and that night, dressed entirely in white, they dropped over the walls to the frozen water below. They moved, silent and invisible, in the fresh snow, right through Stephen's camp. It was another five years before Matilda gave up and returned to Normandy. But she simply handed the torch to her son Henry, who came to England when he was 16 to carry on the struggle. And so the fighting went on, year after year, and the country was in effect without law and without government. But the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle said, Castles were filled with devils and evil men. Christ and all his saints were asleep. Stephen naturally intended his own son Eustace to succeed him, but in 1153 both Eustace and Stephen's wife fell ill and died. Stephen had had enough. At the end of the year, Stephen and Henry rode together into London. There the king proclaimed a new foundation for the kingdom. Henry was now his own adopted son and would be his successor as King of England. Although Stephen would remain king for life, Henry would take over the government immediately. The next year, utterly worn out, King Stephen retired to his grave. On the 19th of December, 1154, there was a double coronation in Westminster Abbey. The 21-year-old Henry II was crowned king and his 33-year-old wife, Eleanor, was crowned queen consort. Eleanor, Duchess of Aquitaine, knew all about being a queen. When she was 15, orphaned and the richest damsel in France, she was married to the heir to the French throne, and a few days later the pair became king and queen of France. The king of France was a saintly figure with perhaps a rather low sex drive. Eleanor came from a family of lordly troubadours, whose court was dedicated to interesting love affairs. She later said that she thought she'd married a man, but had married a monk. She had a series of affairs, including one with Matilda's husband, Geoffrey of Anjou. He, rather dashingly, wore a sprig of broom, plantaginista, in his hat. So people called him Plantagenet, 
Eventually, all the Angevins, the whole family line, wore it on their crest. She then had an affair with Geoffrey's son, the attractive young Henry, a bright, well-educated athlete with vitality, intelligence, freckles, and money. According to contemporary chronicler, Henry's father had warned his son off her, saying that she'd been his lover, and she was the wife of Henry's overlord. Henry was Duke of Normandy. But Geoffrey died in 1151, and in 1152, Henry got Eleanor pregnant. Louis, who probably didn't know that detail, had their marriage annulled, and she married her toy boy. Of course, she did all she could to encourage his efforts to become King of England and make her a queen again. The coronation of 1154 must have been most satisfying for her. He didn't make his mother's mistake of claiming to be above the law. Instead, maintaining proper form, he issued a charter confirming all the liberties that were in force under his grandfather, Henry I. The combination of his lands and Eleanor's meant that this King of England ruled more than half of France, though as the vassal of the French king. It would have been too much for almost anyone. But Henry was a man of extraordinary restless energy, who travelled vigorously round his realms and would order his court to hit the road with no notice whatever. He got England up and running with astonishing speed. He had all newly built castles destroyed so that individual lords could not stand against him and got the law functioning again. He organised government into ministries with the Chancellor of the Exchequer playing the role we would now recognise as Prime Minister. The chap in question was the son of a London merchant. He was Henry's closest friend and colleague. They joked and drank together, and he lived as the greatest lord in the country, Thomas Beckett. Between them, they reformed the currency, finance, government, and began the changes in the judicial system that would lead to the system of trial by jury. England was beginning to develop a commercial life. Towns were growing, the population was becoming better educated. The new system for running royal courts asked groups of local people, often peasants, to report and decide the facts of the case. The system that had worked for the conqueror, allowing the people to run their own country, was at the heart of Henry's way of getting everything up and running again. Perhaps that was why he needed a Londoner at the heart of his government. The next stage in his reforms was to reduce the power of the church, which had become the only functioning judicial institution during the chaos of Stephen's wars. Anyone accused of a crime who could read a line of Latin was deemed to be a churchman. That made them immune from the royal court. They could only be judged and punished by the church. Of course, the church wouldn't agree to give up its privileges. So when the Archbishop of Canterbury died in 1162, it seemed a smart idea to install Thomas as the new Archbishop. Then he would deliver the church to Henry. Actually, it seemed a pretty terrible idea to Matilda, who warned Henry not to do it. What did his mother know? Look what a mess she'd made of things. Eleanor was also against it, and she hadn't made a mess of anything. She'd been a very competent regent when Henry had been abroad, and must have seen what Henry had not seen, that Thomas Beckett's driving force was not loyalty to Henry. Oh, surely not. She was just jealous that Henry spent more time with Thomas than with her. Henry was sure it was a really good idea. Of course, it was a really bad idea. Why did Beckett become fanatically committed to the church as soon as he got the job? Why did he wear Hessian underwear with lice and lash his body? Why did he oppose the king's plans more fiercely than any other bishop? He ended up excommunicating the bishops of London and Salisbury and sacking the Archbishop of York for not opposing the king. He'd already acquired all the earthly power and wealth possible. Now he had a bigger ambition. He was arguing that the church must rule everyone, including the king. This was especially dangerous as Becket was hugely popular. Henry was given to rages, and the situation was bound to enrage him. Who will rid me of this turbulent priest? On the 29th of December, 1170, four of Henry's loyal knights did just that. Slicing off the top of his head at the altar of his cathedral, in the words of an eyewitness, the red of the blood mixed with the white of the brains, like white of the lily and the red of the rose. This was shocking. Henry had to distance himself from Becket's murder and win the hearts and minds of his subjects. Becket was immediately the most popular martyr in the country. A hundred thousand pilgrims flocked to the site of his death, 
he would obviously be made a saint as soon as possible. The danger, of course, was that the Pope would excommunicate Henry and pronounce an anathema against him as the murderer of England's primate. The population would turn against him in England and the King of France would seize his vast lands across the Channel. Henry immediately fasted, went into extravagant mourning and then did penance. Prostrating himself before the Canterbury altar, he was publicly lashed by a monk. It worked. He saved his kingdom from the Pope. Saving it from Eleanor was much more difficult. Eleanor and Henry had drifted apart, partly because of his love affairs and partly because she feared that Henry's adventure with Becket threatened her own beloved Aquitaine. She had gone back there. She set up her own court, the Court of Love, and that was where she raised her sons as romantic warriors and plotted against him. Henry imprisoned her there for 16 years, but her plots continued unabated. She supported her older sons in rebellion against Henry, trying not only to ensure her control over her own lands, but to take over from him. The only one who remained loyal was John, the youngest. In 1189, the oldest surviving son, Richard, inflicted a major defeat on his father. Henry met Richard near the Loire to arrange peace terms, but when they publicly embraced, Henry quietly growled, May the Lord spare me until I've taken vengeance on you. The second had been defeated in battle by his own eldest surviving son, Richard. Only one of his sons had remained loyal, the youngest, John. Back in his own chateau, Henry asked for all Richard's supporters to be read out. The first name on the list was John's. Henry was heartbroken. He died in delirium a few days later. Eleanor's imprisonment was over. Henry had recognized Richard as his heir, and Richard intended Eleanor to rule England. He had more important things to do. Crusade. Eleanor had been on crusade when she was young, as the wife of the King of France, but also as the leader of her own feudal army. And now the Saracens had reconquered Jerusalem. Richard the Romantic, Richard the Lionheart, was a totally fearless warrior whose whole upbringing had been based on Eleanor's idea of chivalry. Poet and swordsman, Christian knight and tournament hero, a handsome and dashing leader of armies, Richard tried to live out the fantasy life of one of the heroes of Arthurian literature from the stories told and sung in the court of love. He came to London for his coronation, but only so that he could collect the funds to pay for his great crusade to recover Jerusalem from Saladin. He went off on his crusade, declaring that he would sell London if he could find a buyer. The crusade itself, the Third Crusade, was a sequence of great heroic and daring actions that completely failed to conquer Jerusalem, associated with bursts of extreme brutality. Saladin quite rightly pointed out that while Richard might be able to get an army into the city, if he wanted to hold on to it, he would have to spend the rest of his life there. The two men never met, but they fascinated and respected each other. When Richard was ill, Saladin sent his doctor. The final truce ensured that Christian pilgrims would be free to visit the holy city. But that had actually been Saladin's policy before the crusade even began. Richard typically decided to make the journey home in 1192 into an adventure, traveling alone and in disguise. That was how he got captured and ended up imprisoned by Duke Leopold of Austria, a man he'd repeatedly insulted during the crusade. The King of England had been found in an inn in Vienna, unconvincingly disguised as a kitchen knave. The ransom Leopold demanded was £100,000, about eight years' income to the Exchequer. Richard's recklessness was crippling for the kingdom and eventually fatal for him. As a storybook hero, he always seems to have expected a happy ending and would sometimes even forget to put on armour. That was how he got killed in the end, taking a stupid chance at an unimportant siege in 1199. A crossbow bolt wound became infected. While he was dying, the man who'd loosed the shot was captured and delivered to him, and Richard carried on behaving as though he was in a storybook, making a great gesture of releasing the man and giving him money. Richard had no heir. He named his brother, the 32-year-old John, as his successor, 
Richard, aged 41, died in his mother's arms, England's hero king who detested the country and had spent six months of his reign there. And the man who'd killed him was re-arrested and flayed alive. His little brother John was never meant to be king. His father had called him John Lackland because there was originally no part of the huge Angevin empire left for him. And the three problems that lurked at the core of monarchy in England now became crises. How did succession work? What was the balance between the king and the church? And what legal limits existed on royal power, especially when it came to taxes? To begin with, was he really Richard's proper successor? One of his elder brothers, Geoffrey, had died leaving a son, Arthur, and there were barons in Anjou and Maine who argued that this 13-year-old was the proper successor. They were supported by Philip, King of France. The only way to settle a succession dispute was by violence, so John went to war. His men captured the boy, and he was never seen again. It was generally believed that John drowned him, which was the wrong way to solve the problem. It guaranteed that Arthur would not be king, but it left a very nasty smell. It didn't stop the King of France from keeping the war going, and by 1205, John was driven out of most of France, including Aquitaine and even Normandy. The issue of church power also came up again. It was John's bad luck to be confronted by an exceptionally militant and aggressive Pope, Innocent III. Innocent maintained that kings had to submit to popes. When the Archbishop of Canterbury died, Innocent announced that Stephen Langton, who happened to be English, was the new Archbishop. John refused to accept the Pope's man. Rome wouldn't give ground and neither would John. In 1209, the Vatican excommunicated the King of England and his whole kingdom. Back in England, John attempted to carry on regardless. The Pope declared John deposed and that anyone who even spoke to him was excommunicated. According to one chronicler, John decided at this point to join the enemy. In 1213, he sent a delegation to the Emir of Morocco, offering to adopt Islam and turn England into an Islamic country in return for protection. That would have turned history upside down. Is it true? The Emir, according to the story, told the envoys not to be so silly. In fact, John was reduced to total surrender. The Pope demanded that he submit himself as a vassal of the church and that England should become a papal fief instead of a sovereign kingdom. So in 1213, Stephen Langton, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, took up his post as a representative of the new overlord of England. In that capacity, he decided to sort out the third issue, the limits of the king's power over his subjects. Barons were now virtually an organized political party. This is the seal of the Barons of London. Langton presented them with the charter issued by Henry I and suggested that they demand something along the same lines but a bit clearer. The Magna Carta. This famous document was signed in June 1215. John and Richard had both tried to meet their costs by massive increases in feudal dues and legal charges and most of the Magna Carta is an effort to reverse these. But there are also other clauses that show that Langton and the barons thought that laws must bind the king himself as well as everyone else. There was a notion of proper kingship in England, and the Magna Carta tried to spell out what that meant. If Langton had not been an Englishman, the Magna Carta would probably have looked very different. And it was certainly incomprehensible to Pope Innocent, who saw it as a baffling and immoral limitation on the absolute power of the feudal lord of England who was, of course, himself. So Innocent issued a papal bull excommunicating anyone who stood by or tried to carry out Magna Carta. And Stephen Langton found himself suspended from his job and recalled to Rome. And John marched through England at the head of an army composed largely of foreign troops, crushing the barons and destroying their property. And that's why the barons went to France and got a new king of their own, Louis the son of the King of France.
so came the second French invasion of England in 1216. It was about the same size as the invasion of 1066, and Louis landed unopposed. He was greeted with general enthusiasm and was hailed as King of England in a high mass at St. Paul's Cathedral. He set up his own government and his army began its pursuit of John's dwindling forces. John was assembling an army to stage the great final battle and was traveling along the seashore from Lynn to Lincolnshire. A miscalculation of the tide was all he needed. His whole baggage train was washed away, including his treasure and the crown jewels. Distraught, broken, he made his way to an abbey at Swineshead, where he was comforted with the monk's latest experiment in beer making, which seems to have brought on dysentery, fever, and death. Louis the first and last, the king no one's ever heard of, now controlled most of the country. But the story of what happened to him and how his memory was erased has to wait for the next episode. The story continues with the medieval kings and queens of England tonight at 10. And to find out more about Thomas Beckett's life and murder, Sky Digital viewers press red. Coming up on UK TV history, decisive weapons. What a difference the T-34 tank made to Soviet fortunes in World War II.